Tell me, are you upset? And why are you upset? Let me share an experience with you, uh, with myself and the cameraman. Uh, we worked on a production, and he was very excited, and he made a little video clip to send to the producers. And when he showed this to me, I was excited, and I thought, well, the man's quali quality is so good, I'm sure they'll accept it. And he was excited. And I showed it to my wife, and she was excited. But sometimes we come with expectations to life. What happens? <laughs> we were devastated. They didn't like what we were doing and we were trying our best. And it worried me, me especially. The cameraman is, is a more balanced man than I am. And uh, I walked one morning and I spoke to the Lord about this. And this is what came to me. You know, sometimes our motives are selfish, but it's so subtle. We think we're doing a work for the Lord, but uh, sometimes self is mixed with it. And I said to the Lord, maybe I had some selfishness to see success in this entire project that we were working on. And then I said to the Lord, if there's selfishness in my heart, please remove it. And you know, the peace of the Lord just flooded my soul. In self-denial, you find sweet peace. Because if you emptied yourself of self, you have room for the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. I like what the Olympics uh, slogan is. It's not so much that you win the race, but in the spirit you are running. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to run in the spirit. If I win, if I get success, fine. If not, my aim is to give the best I have. Leave the rest to the Lord. So if you have a struggle with selfishness, self-denial replaces that and you'll enjoy peace. Now last time we studied about the lots, the dice, that were cast over the cloak of Jesus, his last possession. Let's refresh our minds on the subject before we proceed with our series. Psalms 12 verse 19 says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 700 years before this, maybe a thousand years from the time of David, the Lord predicted that this would happen at the cross. And this is what we see happened. John 19, 23. <clears throat> then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. To each soldier a part. So there were four four soldiers and also the tunic now the tunic was without seam woven from the top in one piece unique piece of clothing 24 they said therefore among themselves let us not tear it but cast lots for it so they took out their dices and they started to cast lots whose it shall be that the scriptures says john might be fulfilled, which says, they divided, and he's quoting Psalms here, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. I love prophecy. I love archaeology. It, it just brings luster to the Bible. Four soldiers. Can you see it? Undresses Jesus. You know, the emphasis is not so much on physical pain, but shame. Shame. To the Hebrew mind, this was greater than pain. They undressed him. He's naked. As soon as Jesus was nailed to the cross, it was lifted by strong men, I think these four soldiers, 
and with a great violence thrust into the place prepared for it. Now, if you've been to the sepulchre in Jerusalem, maybe you saw the hole in which the cross was placed, but this caused a lot of pain, intense pain and agony to the Son of God. The following division has been suggested. This is just a suggestion, but I like it. The headgear on his, on his head, the sandals, the girdle, the belt, and the talit. You're looking at the talit. That was the outer garment with, the, with its fringe, fringes. This was the outer garment with its fringes. And when you visit the Wailing Wall, you can see the Talit. Some of the people wearing it when they come and worship. So the Talit from the time of Christ today, more or less the same. The one whose feet fitted his sandals best, received it. So the soldiers fitted the sandals and only one said, well, I think it fits me. And he received the sandals. Verse 23, the tunic was without seam woven from the top in one piece. And in this illust illustration you can see more or less what it looked like. They could not divide it so they had to cast lots. This is fulfilling a prophecy. You're looking at the very interesting excavation they've made. This is the Roman dice from the time of Christ. And who knows, maybe... These were the dices that were used at the cross. We don't know, but it was something similar, similar like this. Can you hear the sound of the Roman dices as they fall on the white sand stone below the cross? Click, click, click. Click, click, click. Prophecy was being fulfilled this very moment. They threw dices in turn. Number one, number two, number three, number four. One of them got the six and he took the tunic. Elevated to the dices below, another game was played. Another sound was heard. Jesus gambled with his life for us. What a dangerous exercise. If the dice fell on one, we lost. It had to be a six. Otherwise we would be lost forever. But it was a six. He won. His life only displayed one num numeral. The highest it displayed six. A winner from start to finish. He won in my stead. And his victory becomes my victory and your victory. Later that Friday afternoon, a soldier went home with the tunic of Jesus. He had a six on the dice. He got it. His wife says, my dear, where did you get this tunic? Without a seam woven in one piece from top to bottom. Man, the soldier was so proud. I think you know what this picture is telling. The woman who had the problem who touched the hem of his tunic. Same that was being gambled away on Calvary. Matthew 9.20 And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Now, I was just wondering when I prepared this message, did they hear about this story? That the tunic they have in their possession was once used to heal a woman. Jesus was stripped of his physical dress so that someone else could wear it. The soldier wore that dress. 
the one that crucified him, was dressed in the garment of Jesus. On Calvary, Jesus was stripped of his garment of righteousness. He became naked so that we could wear his garment of righteousness. This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, garment of righteousness, has in it not one thread of human devising. You see, we can only get to heaven by having faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring my deeds, simply to the cross I cling. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, the dress, and this he offers to impart to us. If you need that dress, it's there. Just take it. Just take it and enjoy the fullness of his righteousness. Don't freeze in the blizzards of guilt feelings. Cover yourself with a coat of the righteousness of Christ. Don't stand in the cold draught of self-righteousness with your scanty dress. You will get sick. Put on the warm coat of his righteousness and stay healthy and stay saved. The four Gospels are not the only source telling us about uh, the sufferings of Jesus. Many centuries ago, the psalmist described it as follows. 69 verses 20 and 21. Reproach has broken my heart. Has reproach broken your heart? And I'm full of heaviness. You know, while in heaven, in full divinity, he didn't feel our problems, but he was incarnate and came to feel what we are feeling. And I'm full of heaviness. Maybe you are full of heaviness this moment. I looked for someone to take pity. He was human, looking for someone to take pity. But there was none. And for comforters. But I found none. Maybe you are looking for comforters and you find none. For my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Sometimes we, we need a draught of kind friendship then we receive vinegar. Have you longed in vain for sympathetic support? I remember once I had to, I had to explain my situation to certain uh, celebrities. But you know, they, they didn't understand me. They, they didn't see the, my my urge. <laughs> Jesus is the only one who understands your pain. You can always speak to him. To a lesser or greater uh, fact, he, he went through what you are going through. How did he behave when he was misunderstood and found no sympathy? Uh, we say he's a gentleman. Christ was the greatest gentleman. Good-mannered, perfect human being. Let us behave courteous and forgiving like Jesus. Courteous. There's no place for force, pulling out your spear like Peter in God's kingdom. This kingdom of God only succeeds through the cross, Calvary. When we are devastated, Jesus can identify with us. On Calvary, he took our devastation upon himself. So you can go to him with your small devast devastation and enjoy, identify with his bigger one. We should not allow unkind treatment to make us unkind. You know, this is the first reaction of our fallen human nature. Our role model, Jesus 
Christ became kinder under unpleasant circumstances. Every time just kinder and kinder. A kind disposition usually develops under difficult circumstances. Plain seas don't make good sailors. Do not become unpleasant when people crucify you. Pray the prayer of Jesus. Father, please forgive them. They know not what they do. Trials, said somebody. Trials when seen as educators will produce joy. Don't curse the darkness. Light the candle. Change the afflictions, the trials of life into something positive. Learn something. These are teachers. Cruel teachers at times. But teachers with high expectations of what you and I can become. Matthew 27 verse 34 they gave him sour wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. No painkiller for him because he wanted to experience our physical pain. One great psychologist, when he was dying, he said, I don't want any medication. I want my brain as clear as possible till I die. Freud. Matthew 27, 39, 40. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads. I don't know how they did this. And saying, you destroy the temple and build it in three days. <laughs> you're boasting, man. You're arrogant. The temple is there, but you're dying. And build it in three days. Save yourself. If you are so smart, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Fortunately, he didn't. <laughs> 41, 42. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. I'm so glad he didn't save himself. Otherwise, we would have been lost. If he's the king of Israel, as it says there on the on the cross, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Nonsense. Nonsense. They wouldn't. 30, 43, 44. He trusted in God. This is what he told us. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. We don't think God would, would have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. You know, there are times when I said to my wife, please, you can correct me and discipline me and uh, preach to me. But right now, I'm not in a, in a mood to listen to your edification. Jesus wasn't in a mood while he was dying to listen to what was going on besides him. What was it that kept him on the cross when he could have come down? He could have called 10,000 angels to redeem the world and set him free. But he chose to die alone for you and me. In the Israeli Museum, this is the only archaeological evidence of the crucifixion from the time of Christ. Maybe they'll excavate some more later on. But here you see a nail being hit through the ankle. And right at the end, you see the nail coming back. Now, archaeologists reckon that inside the wood, there was a hard knot and the, the nail bent. But this is what happened to Jesus. And the ankle is so sensitive. So the nail went through, ankle and then into the cross. Was it the nails that kept him on the cross? 
No. Was it Pilate? The legal aspect of it? No. What prevented him from coming down from the cross? You. It was you, my dear friend. It was me. Because he wanted to pay the full account of our sins. He paid the full account. Have you received the receipt yet? It was love for me that nailed him to the tree to die in agony for all my sin, for my own guilt and blame. The great Redeemer came, willing to bear the shame of all my sin. Oh, what a Saviour is mine. In him God's mercies combine. His love can never decline. And he loves me. He loves you. You are precious in his sight. He paid with his life to save you. Please accept his salvation continuously. So what happens when we accept the invitation to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow Christ? What happened to him? He died. Uh, I've got a friend, Walter Fight. We talk quite often. And I say to him, remember, when he did something good and people didn't like it, remember, Walter, every good deed will be punished. <laughs> and then when I tell him, you know what happened to me? I was so kind to this person. And then he, he interferes and says, remember, every good deed will be punished. So, have you seen it? When Jesus decided to do the best deed ever, he was punished. His every good deed was punished. Exactly what happened to him? The cross of Calvary. And this is where we should often visit. I must stay on the cross of self-denial until selfishness dies inside of me. But when you wake up in the morning, Mr. Selfishness will be there again. Paul says, I die daily. And every time you die, you find new peace and a new resurrection. After self-denial, there awaits a glorious resurrection every time. Resurrection to a new appreciation of Christ and the value of people around you. The cross of Christ invites us to die in order to live. And this is a law in nature. The seed must die in order to live. In the spiritual realm, same. You have to die continually to your selfishness. Our greatest enemy is inside of us. Die, 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 so that you can live, live, live. The dying, the dying victims watches the spectators at the scene of their crucifixion. By the way, one of them was converted on the cross. And it's good to be converted on the cross. They also watch the human traffic to and fro from the temple and the Passover feast. People moving around, talking, shouting, laughing, crying. The sun that rose early that morning now shines in their faces. And this is a bit awkward. It is very awkward because there is no way they can put their hand before the sun. They had to endure the elements of nature. The sun moves slowly over the sad event of Calvary. Can you see it? It's on its brightest. It's almost noon. The three convicted ones spent almost three hours in pain from nine o'clock to twelve o'clock. Our focus is on the middle cross 
where Jesus hangs. Look at him. Periodically, drops of blood trickles down to the others on the white sandstone of Calvary. Jesus is anemic as a result of the many blows, wounds with which he came to heal us. The nails opened a fountain of blood which oozes from the many wounds. Up to this stage, he fulfilled the office of prophet, of king, and of a priest. Prophet, king, priest. As prophet, he spoke to the daughters of Jerusalem, telling them, telling them what was going to happen. As priest, he interceded for his executioners. Father, forgive them. He is the Redeemer priest because he forgave the thief on the cross. You know, hanging there, listening to the, to the people insulting him, came the sweet melody of a sinner who wants to be saved. And on the cross, Jesus had that joy amidst his pain and confusion. But now he also becomes the sacrificial lamb who dies for the sins of the world. King, priest, prophet, now also the sacrificial lamb. He is shedding his blood for the sins of the world. The inscription above his head in three world languages says he is king. Top Hebrew, then we get Greek, and then we get Roman. He is the king, crowned as the king of suffering. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Why is he on the cross? How does it affect me? Jesus on the cross. Why study the signs of the cross? Why spending time on the study? How often should we meditate on the sacrifice? As we dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened. And we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, my friend, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Now sometimes we become so important in ourselves. People criticize us and we feel so bad died to self. Let us prayerfully meditate on what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. Go there often to get perspective. Look at unselfishness. Look at behavior beyond comprehension. The fact that people got used to wickedness, that's very sad. Not seeing its ugliness affected Jesus deeply. Because sin destroys his precious creation. Knowing that so many people were going to reject his offer of salvation was worse than the physical pain of the cross. Can you read his mind? I'm bringing you salvation and everlasting joy and happiness. And you reject it. You know what you're doing. I paid such a big price for you. And you, you reject it. That was more painful than the physical pain he suffered. He experiences the individual and corporate sin of the world. But more painful, he felt the wrath of God because he carried my sins. And this emotion eventually crushed and killed him. Only in heaven one day, when God is going to give us greater brain power, because we cannot fathom it now, will we appreciate 
His gift of salvation. When we come to heavenly bliss and realize that He left it all to come down to shame, pain and death, then we will start appreciating the signs of, re of, of redemption. At the well of Jacob, he revealed God's forgiving love to the most notorious woman of the town. You can read the story in the book of John. This was the main theme of his ministry. God's forgiving love. What a theme. And it's so important to see God in the right perspective. Pure, kind, loving. And he also has discipline. And how he carries a sinful mess to the cross. He felt the mess she felt. The remorse she felt, he felt. He experiences her contamination. Oh. And yours and mine. But worst of, all, worst of all, in the process, God turns away his face from the son. The father despises Jesus for her sake. Isaiah 59 verse 1 But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin separates us from God. So if you harbor sin in your heart, please get rid of it. You cannot be separated from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you. You cannot see his face while willfully sinning so that he will not hear. He cannot hear you. My sins caused a separation between the Father and Jesus. Can you comprehend it? Uh, will we ever realize the damage our sins wrought? Separation is the worst kind of sin. Pain that none of us ever experienced pierces the heart of Jesus. Because of our sins, a friendship of all eternity was shattered at Calvary. You know, the longer you love someone, the deeper the pain when separation enters that relationship. And Jesus tumbles down a dark bottomless pit of hurt and agony and darkness. The cruel arms of my sin pulls him away from his father. The wicked arms of my sin pushes Jesus into the midnight darkness of despair. My sins hurls him further and further away from the father. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart. Now listen to this can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. A separation of eternity was crushing him. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. So he died as a lost person. He couldn't see through the portals of the tomb. He had to go through this to save you and me from this kind of despair at the end of time. He died as a lost sinner in my stead. To, stay, to save me this experience, the greatest of agonies. If you and I should be lost one day, this would be the greatest agony. Seeing the new Jerusalem coming down and realize we could have been there. The house has been built and we lost because of selfishness, sin. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the father's acceptance of the sacrifice. There was no hope. 
He feared that sin was so offensive to God when he tasted it, that their separation was to be eternal. What a price he paid. It was the sense of sin and bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Has someone who you loved for many years reject you? This is what happened to Jesus in the infinitely greater measure. With amazement, angels witnessed the Savior's despairing agony. The hosts of heaven veiled their faces from the fearful sight. How did inanimate nature express sympathy with its insulted, dying author? The Son refused to look upon this awful scene and it was suddenly dark. How did this affect the people jeering at him, insulting him? Its full bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Maybe the father put his hand in front of the sun so that people could not see the agony he went through those last three hours. Complete darkness, like a funeral pall, enveloped the cross. Matthew 27, verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. It was a blockout. The entire country was enveloped in darkness. The sun was shining in all its brightness over Cal Calvary. Jesus' desperate struggle with sin has reached a fearful dimension. The outer darkness added to the inner darkness of his soul. Jesus was alone, so desperately alone. He couldn't see anything. Not physical stuff. Couldn't see his father. He couldn't see beyond the tomb. Utter darkness for three hours. Have you experienced the darkness of painful loneliness? I've met so many lonely people in my life. I feel so sorry for them. Alone. The lyrics of the song says, It was alone. Alone, yes, all alone. He bore it all, yes, all alone. He gave himself to save his own. He suffered, bled, and died. Alone, alone. Isaiah 53 tells us what Jesus must have looked like at this stage. Verse 2. He has no form or comeliness. God put his hand in front of the sun. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Jesus, the most beautiful being in every respect, in the universe became the ugliest through our sin so that I may become kind and beautiful and forgiving. I visited Oakwood University in uh, America once, historic slave cemetery. And I walked through the cemetery and I read a few interesting inscriptions. This one says, and when this transient life shall end, O oh may some kind eternal friend bid me from servitude ascend forever. The slaves complained. Deep river, my home is over Jordan, deep river, Lord. I want to cross over 
into campground. They had a tough life. They wanted to go to another country. And then the other Negro spiritual says, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Standing on top of Calvary, a thought came to me. Where does God the Father fit into this, the greatest drama of history? Where was God when Jesus bore the sins of the world? Somewhere up in the remote distance of the universe, on an elevated throne? Where was he when I passed through the deep waters of pain and rejection? Where was he? The signs of redemption is going to give us an amazing, comforting answer. Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. Help us poor mortals to realize this is the only hope of our salvation. And may we come with our guilt and pain, sin destroyed, past and accept the gift and live forever in Jesus name Amen